Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part three of three on cinematic rendering. And we were talking about bowel, so let's pick up there. Here's a wonderful example of a patient with small bowel obstruction, unknown cause, and you can see there's a mass in the right lower quadrant. And when you look at it carefully, it's actually at the junction of the terminal ilium and the cecum, and this was a lymphoma involving the terminal ilium and cecum, very, very nicely shown there. Again, one of the things I'm showing this case is to show you how fluid in bowel is kind of red with cinematic with the presets we use, and then you can see tumor as being soft tissue density. Or in this case, pancreatic cancer invading and obstructing the duodenum just past the ligament of trites, nicely shown particularly on the 3D reconstructions with volume rendering causing small bowel obstruction. And here it is with the cinematic rendering. Again, you see the mass, you see the fluid in the stomach and the fluid in the duodenum. Um, a, some of the distal bowel doesn't have fluid. You can see its different appearance. So one of the things we are learning is can we use this as a way of making AI better? We also want to know is can we use AI to create the optimal renderings for being able to visualize pathology? One of the challenges with volume rendering has always been, and it's still true with cinematic, I can make images incredibly good that show subtle tumors, but I also can make images that hide tumors. So there is a challenge. Another example, mesenteric adenopathy in a patient with lymphoma. Look at the detail of the small bowel and the mesenteric nodes nicely shown here. And I'll change the rendering just a bit and look at the details. The vessels are stretched, slightly displaced, but look at all of the mesenteric nodes that you're seeing, a really nice example. Now in the kidney, we've done a lot of work there, but let me just show you a few things on the vascular side. Patient with hematuria, look at those little funny looking vessels, I guess they are. And they're particularly easy to see on the MIP imaging where you see the patient not only has multiple aneurysms of the renals, but also of the splenic artery, the SMA, which you can see. And this is polyarthritis nodosa. Look at the detail on the cinematic rendering of those vessels, just beautifully shown. And you can see even the aneurysms that are two or three millimeters are nicely defined coming off the branches off the patient's SMA there or on the left side. Now, in the kidney, we've spoken about using cinematic rendering as a way of being better able to stage tumors, understand uh, different processes. So here's a nice example of a left renal mass, papillary renal cell carcinoma, and there's the texture of the mass. You can see this is excretory phase. Look how nicely you see the patient's renal pelvis and ureters. And again, very nice texture mapping of the tumor in this example. Or in this patient with a large renal mass, hypervascular and multiple satellite lesions, central necrosis, there's a classic volume rendering showing you the renal artery and relationship of the tumor to the renal artery, and then the central necrosis of the mass. Now, one of the things is being written about how necrosis means the tumors are more aggressive, that the patient will need more aggressive therapy. Cinematic rendering is very good at looking and possibly quantifying necrosis as shown here. And then, of course, if you're doing surgical planning, look how nicely you can see the relationship of tumor to vessels to normal tissue. And here I'm just going to change the parameters ever so slightly. And then I'm going to cut into the kidney, showing you the the scarring and the relationship of the interface between tumor and normal kidney there and here as well. Now, we have published on this good article again uh, by Steve Rowe and Linda Chu, and this is very, very important. Now, beyond looking at tumors, we can look at inflammatory processes, we can look at vascular processes. Here's a UPJ, we're unsure why, when you do the 3D rendering with cinematic rendering, you nicely see the accessory renal artery off the lower aorta crossing the UPJ. And that's the reason the patient has a UPJ. It's because of that accessory renal artery. Here it is again changing the rendering parameters, showing this very nicely here and here as well. And you can see that again if I look simply at the... Uh, interactive views. Look how nicely we see the kidney, the dilated pelvis is the negative process, and the multiple right renal arteries, including the renal artery that's causing 
the patient's compression and the UP dray obstruction, that crossing vessel. And here I'm analyzing this again with the patient's uh, changing parameters. So again, interactivity to understand the data set becomes very, very critical. And you can see it here. Here's just one more set of images. And although we typically don't think of sending referring physician video loops, um, or at least with CT, it is something that can prove very valuable. Now the problem is often the PACs can't handle it, but that's a whole nother story. Now in terms of vascular, let me show you this case. This was an IV drug abuser. They thought the patient had maybe an abscess, so they did a CT to look at relationship to the femoral artery. And to their surprise, there was a large femoral artery pseudoaneurysm. You can see some broken needles on the right side by the femoral artery. And here's just showing you the difference of imaging. Image on your left is MIP, and image on your right is volume rendering with a grayscale approach. Here's color-coded volume rendering showing you the large pseudoaneurysm. But now look at the cinematic. Look at the induration in the groin. Look at the large pseudoaneurysm. And now I'm going to rotate the images. I made the skin opaque and I cut through the skin. You see how the femoral artery is compressed by the large pseudoaneurysm. That indeed is important. The pseudoaneurysm is patent. The vessel is patent there, but look at the compression. And you can see it on these additional rotations. Just a beautiful set of images. And here, when I take the bone away and the skin away, there's the images there. And then if I simply go in and look at the renderings here, again, doing things interactive uh, becomes very, very critical. And look at the display as I show both of them interacting. I mean, that is impressive. So yes, there's a pseudoaneurysm, but now you know the relationship and the problem with the femoral artery, its compression and its irregularity, and just beautifully shown. Just a wonderful, wonderful 3D reconstruction in that regard. And here's just a few more images showing that as well. So again, think about how we do things, not just doing cinematic rendering, but doing cinematic with real-time capture. Now in terms of the skin, I showed you the skin in the last patient. I made it opaque. Here's a beautiful example of neurofibromatosis with the multiple skin lesions. Collateral vessels in a patient with SVC occlusion and multiple collaterals beautifully shown, again, changing the rendering algorithm and parameters for showing the skin and soft tissue and the vessels very nicely done in this example. And here's a range of different visualizations of that. And then here it comes again with a 3D map. Again, just simply changing. So one of the things you realize and one of the things we thought about is creating a virtual topogram based on the information, not just showing lines through a patient or the ribs or the pelvis or the spine, but showing the outer side of the patient, which can be very important. There's so much information on the other parts of the scan that we often do not use. And you can see as I rotate these images around, you can see why that can prove to be a very important value. And here I've made the bone a little bit more opaque. I've made the muscle transparent, and I'm showing you the collaterals. So again, a very good demonstration of how you can show specifically what it is you need to see and want to see by simply changing the parameters. Or this example, great case of a patient who had a fracture, but the arm was swelling, and they couldn't figure out why. Maybe there was a hematoma. You see the humeral head fracture, but not much else, a little bit of induration. And here it is on the recons with MIP and volume rendering, classic volume rendering. You see the axillary artery, and you see the brachial artery, and the radial ulnar arteries are all patent. So there's no pseudoaneurysm. There's no vessel occlusion. There's a uh, spiral fracture, and there's angulation. But what no one appreciated was look at the patient's skin. There are multiple blisters on the skin now present, and the patient has a compartment syndrome. That's why you have the blisters. Now you could say, well, maybe someone shouldn't look, but the patient was wrapped up and no one saw this. But look how obvious it is on the CT. Now when you go back to the axials, it wasn't very obvious. You didn't see it at all. Again, those things don't show. The cinematic shows this, which is why we think about doing some sort of virtual topogram. In terms of anatomy, look at the lower extremity. Look at the detail of the vessels and the vascular map shadowing to show the bone, but really focusing in this case not on the muscle or the fat, making the fat transparent to show the patient's vasculature. 
So you can see there's so many things we can do that we're really just getting started. So the reality, preset values, as I've shown you, have can be used in most cases to speed up the process and make it easier. Preset values may change depending on the specific visualization and the scan protocol used. So one of the things about presets, you need to do the same scan protocols every time. If things are too early or too late, you're going to need to change the parameters. And we like to be consistent, which is another reason why consistency is important. AI may prove to be a value, and we're looking at AI as a way of choosing the best parameter set. We spoke about this 30 years ago with Pixar, but today it's a reality. We also would like, even if the computer would pick up, let's say, three or four or five of the best visualizations and would let those be the ones you choose from, we're not asking for the computer to give us the one best, but give me the three or four best, or for different things, whatever is the best. I think visualization of cinematic rendered images can be done with the creation of a video file. As I've showed in this lecture, video files really capture all the information. It's the experience of being there rather than just simply static pictures. And I think newer displays like the Microsoft HoloLens 2 is truly going to enhance the value of cinematic rendering. There was an uh, article just published recently by Ephesol talking about uh, virtual imaging that found that um, photorealistic visualization facilitates image interpretation and improves comprehension of surgical anatomy, that the visualization with cinematic rendering allowed a more correct and faster comprehension of surgical anatomy compared with conventional CT imaging independent of the surgeon's experience. That's pretty, pretty impressive. We're doing work for teaching also. This was from our RSNA exhibit where we're using uh, cinematic rendering to teach anatomy. Now, this lecture I know is scheduled for April, so our app will be out for three months. It's going to come out in January 2020, but you can see what the app does is it teaches you anatomy by looking. So looking, for example, at muscle, we change the parameters, pec major, external oblique, the costochondral junctions, we then look at the bony structures. We then get inside and we look at the vessels. We look at the heart as well. And you can see very nicely here, um, again, just simply click. And you can see the, the motion-related process. So again, very important when you take things like cinematic rendering, not only for diagnosis and management, but also for teaching. The ability to look and understand is really impressively improved. And here's just one more set of images showing you the individual muscle groups. And this will be indeed be very exciting. So it's really something that we're working hard on and probably will expand to other areas of the body. So cinematic rendering in AI. Can AI be used to optimize the visualization from the infinite rendering possibilities? We think so. Can AI be used to optimize texture mapping for lesion classification? Yes, we think that's possible. We think we can do topograms with cinematic rendering. The AI selection of the individual optimal parameters for each case. And then can we merge cinematic with PET data or other functional imaging data will prove to be important. In an editorial, Philippe Soyer, cinematic rendering needs isotropic voxels from volumetric CT data, similar to those used for MIP, volume rendering and surface rendering visualizations. Basically, cinematic rendering is very similar to volume rendering, although it uses a more complex global lighting model. The, the global lighting model produces high degrees of surface detail and shadowing effects that generate depth in the 3D visualizations and give a photorealistic quality to the images. Preliminary works, two of which were in the article, were articles in this journal, show that cinematic rendering produces photorealistic images with enhanced detail by comparison with other 3D visualization techniques. So again, we're only getting started, and I believe the best is yet to come, but I think you have to admit there is some really good opportunity. And as we move forward, we'll keep you informed. Catch you later. Bye-bye. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.